She does psychology with Dr. Anna. So she is a doctor of psychology and she made a video called Stop Expecting Therapy to Save Your Life. And this is what I mean when I say this. I think to be a whole human being, this is my theory, you need to have your mental health understood, like your brain. How does your brain function as a tool? And then your philosophy, your spirituality, your understanding of life. What's your philosophy around life existing? What do your ideas mean to you? What does it mean to be a person? And this is kind of where she goes into it. Therapy is great, but it's not gonna fix you because you have to wanna do the work. So you're gonna have to know why you're doing the work. And therapy can have you help you like dissect that and move into it. But I think without philosophy, therapy is kind of a useless tool. I think people probably struggle in therapy because they don't know why they're doing it. Why even get better? And that why is based off of your understanding of your values and what you're doing on the planet. So check this part of the video out. It's not the whole video. It's just a section. Seeking a quick fix will only augment your distress because remember, pain times resistance equals suffering. And thirdly, mental health is more than just the absence of mental illness. Let's break this all down. Seeking a quick fix will only augment your distress. What do I mean by this? Again, anytime we want a quick fix for something, we are practicing resistance of reality. And resistance of reality is what transforms pain into suffering. For example, look at panic disorder. Panic disorder on the surface is a person who experiences panic attacks, but that's not what it is. Panic disorder is a person who is afraid of experiencing panic attacks and in doing so triggers more panic attacks. Panic disorder is basically fear about fear, resistance to fear. What about OCD? OCD is basically a fear of discomfort and a fear of uncertainty, practicing resistance towards those things. If people with OCD could acknowledge that sometimes they're going to be uncomfortable or sometimes there's going to be uncertainty about safety, they might not meet criteria for OCD anymore. Narcissistic personality disorder is the resistance of one's own imperfection. Borderline personality disorder can be conceptualized as the resistance of the possibility of being abandoned, of being alone. Well, you see almost okay so just really that very fast since i was diagnosed with borderline which i do think was an accurate diagnosis and then obviously moving forward i think there's some underlining ways in which my brain works that i think would be really good to know just to be a little bit more stable because like chat says the work never ends like anyone says if you're being introspective and you're doing the work you're never without mystery when it comes to the self right so when it comes to having borderline, I distinctly remember moving out of my mom and dad's house. I've been living on my own since my early 20s. Um, I've had a couple of stints where I've moved in with friends or family temporarily before moving out again. That's like a normal journey. But I've always, you know, I've been out of my parents' house for a really long time. And I remember being on the phone with my mom. And I remember calling her like every day for a week and just crying so hard while I was working two jobs, you know, trying to socialize, trying to be active, trying to be a person. I just remember thinking like, I feel so alone. And I just didn't understand what I was seeking in the world. And I truly think this ties into my theory about being a whole human being and being fully seen by the world. I really think it hurts to not feel seen. And sometimes I think we expect people to see us when it's inappropriate, at least for the way that my brain works. Because I was told my whole life through media, through all these things that your best friend knows everything about you. Your friends know everything about you. Everyone understands everything. A, a real person, a real friend is somebody who gets you. But the truth is when you live in a world as diverse and nuanced as we do, I think it's unfair to ask people to understand every little part about you when you're still learning about yourself and you'll be learning about yourself forever. I think to let someone see you truly for all the facet, like all the faceted parts that you are, all the nuanced parts that you are is such a deep and profound thing that sometimes it happens very quickly. Like you meet somebody on a subway and you're connecting right away and that's great. But sometimes you never meet a person who quite sees that part of you. So it's really lucky when you do, right? So I think for me, having borderline also came from what my environment told me to expect. And I also think this plays into the loneliness epidemic we've been seeing. The world is so lonely, but you're not getting diagnosed with borderline. So what's going on? And I think it's people who aren't feeling seen. They're not recontextualizing their own existence. They're not asking themselves what they're doing here. They're not having larger conversations about their meaning. And then you tie that into mental health or other things. Well, you know, how are they going to have the motivation to seek out help for their mental health when they don't even know what's going on in the first place in terms of what they're doing on the planet, right? Most every mental health disorder and issue is not caused by the darkness that it consists of. It's caused by the resistance to the darkness. Most disorders 
are disorders of resistance, not of pain. But how do we define what is successful therapy and what is good mental health? One perspective is that it's the absence of mental illness. And this is kind of equivalent with the medical view, that you're healthy when you go into remission from cancer or when you bounce back from a cold. The problem with this way of defining health is that it doesn't account for incurable illnesses like autoimmune disorders, cancer that can't be beat, chronic illness. So is a person unhealthy just because they have endometriosis? Are they unhealthier than a person who has no illnesses that we know of, but also doesn't do anything to let their body and mind flourish? That I think this is one of the dilemmas with having the stigma of having a, a label, but I heavily believe in proper categorization. So a label is a appropriate as long as it's reasonable. I obviously think I'm a much healthier person as a person with borderline than people who don't have borderline, who don't have their figured out in some capacity. And I think that's hard for people to think because they think like, no, you're the one with the personality disorder. You're unhealthy. Yeah, but a personality or personality disorder is not that big of a deal if you've got it in check. Like, I just don't think it is, at least for me, my exp my personal experience is that it's just not that big of a deal in that way as long as I keep myself healthy. Obviously, it's not without its challenges. And this is where it's, you know, the dilemma is, do you play up your symptoms in order to get help? But also, do you make sure that people know you're better off than you are? Obviously, I see myself being more healthy than some people, not every person, just some people that I meet. And I'm like, oh, and that's kind of nice. But also, it's an indication that you don't need a personality disorder to be unhealthy. And I think people think you do. I think a lot of people think, well, there's nothing wrong with me. It doesn't mean you're healthy. Just because there's not a label to give you, like in a way that you'll accept, doesn't mean you're not unhealthy. And so there's something about that that can be very hard for people to face. And then, of course, again, the, the stigma is once you have the title, then you're never healthy. You're never allowed to, to own healthiness, which is just a really silly narrative, right? That doesn't quite make sense to me. What do you think? Alternative perspective is that mental health is not just the absence of illness, but rather a life filled with meaning, with joy, mm. gratitude, flow, beauty. That's why all of the prompts in A Season of Life are meant to evoke more of these things, because it's not just about surviving, it's about flourishing. Mental health is also about having quality relationships, healthy interpersonal patterns, a life filled with connection. Also, like one of the things that was so interesting about me as a patient and having borderline is I did have a lot of good relationships. I did have job security. I did have a lot of pretty good habits, even though I had a lot of bad habits. And it was confusing to my therapist. And to be honest with you, if you really want to check the medical community, you also have to ask yourself, like, I got diagnosed very quickly with borderline and PTSD. Like I didn't do any special testing for it. I went in, they gave me like a little questionnaire and I did it and they're like, cool, borderline. And I was like, okay. And it was very empathetic and a very beautiful process, but it doesn't really matter. The, the label they gave me, what matters is the therapy worked. That's kind of my belief. And plus personality disorders aren't like, um, they're constructs. So it, it's not like I have to think about it as something a little bit more concrete, I think, is just something that I think explains my where I was in my life, right? So for me, when I'm having this conversation with myself or around my own illnesses, I have to remember that I saw one person who gave me a diagnosis or I saw one therapist did said I didn't have borderline and one therapist said I did. So who was right? Obviously, the woman who said I did have borderline, her therapy didn't work for me and it made it worse. The woman who said I did have borderline gave me DBT and it saved my life. But it saved my life because I was also reading heavily. I had a job. I had a relationship. I had friends. I had community members that relied on me. I had a whole system of people. So, you know, I'm not one of the, there's a spectrum of how people experience even fibromyalgia or borderline. Like I see fibromyalgia people talk about not being able to work and not being able, being able to do X, Y, and Z things. And that's a valid experience that they're having that I obviously don't have in that way right? I meet tons of people all the time with labels, same as mine, and we are not living the same life. And that's because we are not a monolith. We are having different experiences, right? We have different experiences. And so the question is, which experience are you having? I never thought much about the borderline label because I just didn't understand the stigma around it. And I still don't think it matters because people who are going to stigmatize you for it, I think are just projecting their own trauma. But what matters is like, I got better. My whole life has shifted. And same with fibromyalgia. If that's the wrong diagnosis, who cares? The stuff that I'm doing is helping mitigate my pain. Today is a big pain day, but you know what? Pop an ibuprofen and move on. You know, and the good news is I only pop an ibuprofen maybe 
once every 10 days, maybe less, once every 15, I don't pop an ibuprofen very often because usually when I'm working out, it helps. So my workout didn't work this week. For whatever reason, my fibro is more intense. No problem. I'll just cope. <laughs> you know, I'll just do what I have to do. But that's the thing is like when you're exploring yourself and your journey, you got to see who you are in the story, right? Because it's really going to change the outcome, in my opinion. About having self-compassion, having compassion for other people, having a sense of self-efficacy, like you can accomplish the things you set out to do, having the ability to get back up after a period of hardship, you know, resilience, having authenticity, feeling aligned with your values, having self-awareness, treating yourself and others kindly. In this way of defining mental health, a person could still meet criteria for a mental health diagnosis or have symptoms of something, and they would still be healthy. Just because they struggle with a mental illness doesn't mean they're unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Viewing things in this way can be inclusive of the person living with bipolar disorder mm -hmm. who may always need to keep an eye out for periods of depression. Did you hear what she just said? I just want to say it out loud in case people didn't hear it. Living with a mental health problem does not mean you're unhealthy. Living with a mental illness does not mean you're unhealthy. I really want you to sink that into your whole, just embody that whole sentence. Because again... The way we punish people for having an experience is why people are having such a huge struggle maintaining healthiness. People are so good at lying to themselves and they are so unhealthy that they will point fingers at people with a, a, a label and say, you're the unhealthy one. You have a label, which is why they're afraid to go to a therapist and get a label, because if they get the label, they'll also be one of those sick people. The label is meant to help you. It shouldn't be hindering you. If somebody gives you a diagnosis, it should be to help you, not to stigmatize. And if we're only giving labels out to punish people, then of course labels would not be helpful. Helpful. The label should be there to help you, period. So for me, my labels help me. I like to be categorized. I like to say, oh, this is the experience I'm having. For Brittany's brain, it's very helpful to know what to tackle. When my rheumatologist told me, you can make two decisions as a fibro patient, Brittany, you can decide to give up and sink into your pain, or you can work out and have an active life and make an effort to live your life. And I said, fine, that sounds good. Let's do that one. And it's true. It's changed my life. And when I talk to other people who struggle, it's clear that there is a life you can have. I'm, uh, there's like new fibro documentaries coming out. Always people are talking about fibromyalgia. And regardless if fibro is going to be diagnosed in the future as something else, there's a real phenomenon helping ha happening in my body. I mean, the pain I experience is like, it's very strange. It's a very strange thing to live with. And you're never sure, like, should I go to the doctor? I'm in so much pain. No, no, no. It's probably just my fibro. Talk about a new, like, a new problem I'm having, like a new anxiety of like, is this when you go to the doctor? No, no, no. It's probably the fibro. But if it's the fibro, but if it's not, fibro, it's weird. But at least we're working on it. But if you talk to the wrong people about fibro, they'll tell you it's fake. They'll say it's all in your head as if we don't already know. It's a neurological issue. <laughs> they'll literally make fun of you and they'll try to invalidate you because they think you just want to be sick. Don't let other people stop you from being healed. And don't let other people be the reason you stay unhealthy just because they're unhealthy. Unhealthy people tear you down and convince you that you don't need the help you need. If you're asking for help, you obviously need it. Because if you're making up symptoms to get attention, you definitely need help. And if you're not making up the symptoms and you're really feeling it, you definitely need help. Either way, girl, you obviously need help. Or mania their whole life. Or the person who experienced trauma and still manages to have a fulfilling life. Or people with a diagnosis that can't be cured, like something neurodevelopmental, something neurodegenerative. After all, which of these two people are healthier? A person with... ADHD who's trying to live a full life, or someone who doesn't meet criteria for any disorder, but has none of the characteristics I just mentioned of somebody who flourishes. This is why most mm -hmm. therapists don't aim to cure clients anymore, because curing symptoms, no longer meeting criteria for a diagnosis, is not the whole point. It's not what health is. And here's another way that physical health is different from mental health and why we can't really take a purely quantitative medical approach with it. A physician can to some degree manipulate the elements of the body, the muscles, the bones, the skin, the blood vessels, the organs, including the brain. But a therapist cannot directly manipulate the elements of the psyche. The thoughts, the feelings, the behaviors, the motivations, attention, perception, defense mechanisms. A neurologist works on the tangible aspects of the brain, mm -hmm. but a therapist works on the abstract aspects of the mind. 
oof, fire girl. This is so important. Also to the people having the conversation that BPD has a huge remission rate. Yes, it does. And I've made countless videos on this. Dr. K has talked about this. Dr. Kirk Honda has talked about this. Marsha Linehan has talked about this. Borderline has such an amazing recovery rate that the stigma against it is the problem. That's why people don't believe I've been in remission for so long or that I've been chilling because they only know the stereotypes. And that's like the irony is I don't deal with my borderline. She's like a slight, slight, like she's like sleeping beauty in the back of my head. You know what I mean? It's not that I don't have moments of feeling like, oh, rejected, but hey, you can feel rejected and not have borderline. And those moments last 2.5 seconds compared to where they were active in the borderline brain. Any slight rejection instead of lasting two seconds can last a week because you internalize, dissect it and like drown in the what if of the thought, right? So I am here to be living proof that like remission is not only possible, but it's incredibly likely. It's incredibly likely. And I really think it's about finding the right therapist, but I think it's about finding the right relationship with philosophy, your understanding of your life. I meet so many people with borderline who are like, hey, I've been in therapy for 10 years and I'm still not better. And I'm like, do you do any philosophy work? Do you read? Do you ask yourself what you're doing on the planet? And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, start there. What, like... You have to know why you're doing what you're doing, right? You have to know why you wake up every day. If you go to therapy to fix a mental health problem, you still have to go out into the world and live your life. Like you still have to function. And yeah, some people can function with a bare minimum needed, go to work, get job, eat food, make babies. But a lot of us need more than that. A lot of us need a reason to wake up in the morning, especially when you feel like you might be abandoned, right? So- I think this is really important for us to encourage our friends and family or the people in our life. Like you can't just get therapy. You got to dissect yourself as a person, become a whole human being, right? Physical health, spiritual health, mental health. They're all just as important as the other. They're all just as important as the other. And then that last one, financial health, that's about your survival health. How do you, how do you plan to take care of yourself in the world? That's a very big question that people don't ask. And of course, my last one, who are you in the story? What's your trope? Who are you in the story? The brain and the mind are two different things. The only person who can directly control and manipulate their mind is the person to who the mind belongs. A therapist can only use certain interventions that maybe indirectly help a person to do that. But at the end of the day, it's up to the sufferer, the patient themselves, to take actions that will change the way their mental health works, that will change the way their mind works. Call it willpower, call it personal responsibility, call it consciousness, the spirit, the soul, whatever you want to call it, only that person can really heal their mind. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. See what she said? She said, no matter what you call it, the soul, soul, the consciousness, that person is the only person who can heal their mind. The power is in you. You have the strength. You can do it. You can do it right? Because you're the only one who can. People like this therapist, people like me who do philosophy, we're just tools. We give you a tool. We see if it works. If there's not us, it's somebody else. But you cannot have therapy without philosophy in my mind. You have to have both because one has the meaning of the self. That's the you. You're learning about the you that is you. And the you that is you is going to help you make the therapy work for you. It's going to help you decide, okay, how do I have a relationship with that with that mental health issue, whatever it is, right? I think that's that's the key here. That's the key, okay? Chat says, it wasn't until I met somebody with schizophrenia until I realized that the average person knows pretty much nothing about it. People get so much wrong about it. People get so much wrong about everything. That's why your internal lived experience is so important it's why, you know, you have to have a pathway to understanding yourself that maybe be maybe isn't understood by people, but the people who care about it, they understand. And that's the irony of these bubbles coming together and arguing your lived experience. As long as you're being honest with yourself about your lived experience, as long as you're being really interested in dissecting it and being honest, then I think you're you're the most equipped to really understand yourself. I think sometimes even when you're at your worst, you have an insight that just people don't understand. That's why therapy is so ironically funny to me because you have to tell the therapist what's going on. The therapist tells you what's going on, but only because you've told them what's going on. You work in symbiosis. 
You work in symbiosis. You work together. And that's like the thing that I think is so ironic is they think, oh, I walk into a therapist's office and it didn't save my life or it didn't change me or why is this so hard? If only it was that easy. Or you can't do it on your own. You ha When I say go to therapy, I mean just do one of the five things that I think you should do to be a whole human being. Going to therapy is one of the five things I think you should do to be a whole human being. One. One part. One. I don't think people understand. Going to therapy is not the end all be all, right? Chat says, I'm a therapist and I've started to distance myself, esteem from my client outcomes. I can do everything perfectly and the person can still choose not to do anything with it. Exactly. Yeah, that's what's so hard, even as a, a family member, a friend. So many people in my life just, they're on their own journey. And that's why I say, whether you're with me or not, I'm hopping on the ship and I'm taking off. I'm hopping on the ship and I'm taking off, right? Like with peace and love, I can give you as many tools as you want. But if you refuse to get on the boat, like I'm not waiting around. I'm not abandoning you. You can always make your up your own boat and catch up or see me along your journeys. But with peace and love, I'm not waiting around. And I think a lot of people don't know the difference. I'm not abandoning. I'm not saying you can't contact me. This is inner circle stuff. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying I'm going on a journey. If my friends are on a journey, I respect it. But I think a lot of people expect you to sort of tie your boat to theirs. I don't tie my boat to anybody. No, ma'am. You know? All right. Let's finish up this video. What do you think this person's chances of healing are? Somebody with depression goes to a therapist. They smirk at the interventions. They don't do the homework. They don't reflect on the insights gleaned. They don't try to pay attention to new things. They don't try to take part in new behaviors or new ways of thinking or responding to their feelings. Do you think their chances are very strong? No, because the onus is on them to directly change the way their mental health works. And in refusing to do so and saying, well, my therapist is gonna fix me, it's not gonna fix anything. You have to fix you. Mm -hmm. Does this mean that therapy is pointless? Absolutely not. Studies show that all of the main accepted therapies, all of the types of therapy I described, are better than placebo and have similar effectiveness overall, though some are effective for different things. The common feature of what works in therapy is the relationship between the patient and the therapist. Somebody who walks with you in your underworld, cares about what happens to you who makes you feel like you matter, who teaches you better relational patterns, who you can trust even with the darkest parts of you. This is different from any other relationship because it's a one-sided focus on you, accompanied by evidence-based interventions and psychoeducation and skills that can help you and emotional processing by somebody who's trained to be sensitive, who has very specific boundaries that they're willing to uphold, who's somewhat objective because they don't know anybody else in your life. Mm -hmm. doesn't feel like you're being burdensome because it's literally their job. They get fair compensation for the work that they do. So this is a very special relationship. That this is exactly the difference between my second and third, uh, second and fir first and second therapist. My first therapist didn't feel like she was invested in me. It felt like I was just like another paycheck to her and it didn't feel safe to confide in her. It didn't feel safe to tell her my fears. So that relationship didn't work out. I fired her. Then I chose a second therapist and I felt really, really safe with her. Like day one, I was ready. Like day one, I was not only ready to tell her what was up, but she was so sympathetic and empathetic. She was just so lovely. And she was, you know, a little older woman. Like she was very sweet, but very stern. She had good energy. She had very stable energy. And she just, she was a really good person to, you know, bounce ideas off of. And I was really lucky that I got to see her when I did. It was just perfect timing, right? So that I think for me changed my life where I would tell her, and she would process it and then boom. And it did. It really changed my whole life changed. I got the year of therapy and it's not like, oh, I did a year of therapy and then that was it. It was like, no, I did a year of therapy. And then I went on my travels. I read more books. I talked to, you know, I talked to more people. I went and I got, I, I mean, I, it took me, let's say I got, let's say I went to therapy in 2017, 2018. And by 2019, by the end of it, so almost 2020, I was the most stable I had ever been in my life. So it took a little bit of time, like it took like some time between going to therapy and stopping therapy and going on my life adventure to kind of 
stabilize. And then ever since then, it's been, uh, it's not about like, oh, I'm stable. Nothing goes wrong. It's more like, okay, I'm stable. I'm on the track. And now my roller coaster is going and I haven't gone off the track yet. And it's not that I'll never go off the track or things won't go right. It's more like, okay, even if a wheel goes off the track, I know how to get it back on versus my whole, you know, my whole like roller coaster would fall off the track. And I'd be like, well, it's in pieces. I guess I'll put it back together. I haven't had to put together my roller coaster in a very long time. She has just been going up, 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 up. A few dips as life does, but it's always going up. And that's all I'm looking for. Okay. I'm looking for stability that accepts there will be dips, but is always in the long term going up. Like I look at humanity on the Mac micro, there are definitely lots of dips. Oh God. But on the macro, we're going up, guys. It doesn't seem like it. If you zoom into your life, it might feel like, oh God, it's not getting better. It's getting better. Okay. Overall, it is getting better. And that's what I look for because that's really the, it's like the stock market. You want the long-term results, not the short-term. The long-term tells you everything. That you can't just get anywhere else. Therapy can be very valuable. All I'm trying to say here is that you cannot go into therapy expecting a quick fix. You cannot expect to never experience mental anguish in your life. Some types of mental anguish are here to stay and you can live with them and manage them and even flourish despite them. Everything in life is about polarity and cycles. Everything in life is going to be about cycling between light and darkness, cycling between moments of flourishing and moments of distress, of underworlding, of diving into the unconscious and into the dark parts of you. And that is normal. And the more you will resist those dark parts of you, the stronger they will get because the more you're turning your pain into suffering. I hope this made sense. Let me know what you thought. Don't forget to check out the mental health. Great video. We love to see it. So important because you are not just one thing. You are many, many things. Many, many, many things. And I just thought this was so powerful. You know, I was just watching a few of her videos this morning while I was doing my hair and I wasn't thinking much about it, but then she said this and I was like, yes, ma'am. And I think it's because the Discord shared the video. I didn't just click on Anna and one of you were sharing it in the Discord or something. And I was like, then I watched like three or four of her videos today and I was just like, oh yeah, this speaks to my soul. This speaks to my experience. This speaks, the stigma is not helping. It's not helping with narcissists. It's not helping with your mother. It's not helping with anybody. It does not help our communities to build understanding of people through stigma. You must build understanding of people through neutral reality. That's where I tried to come from. That's why people sometimes get upset with me because I'm trying to observe a person. The reason I can completely disagree with a Myron or a Sneeko and still have compassion for them is because it, you know, it makes sense how they got to where they are. If you look at parts of their life, that's public, but also there's obviously a lot of pain there. People don't just get there because there is a lot of pain there. Does it mean I have to do the emotional labor for them? Absolutely not. Does it mean I have to talk to either of them? Absolutely not. Does it mean I have to vouch for either of them? Hell to the fucking no. Does it mean I have to do it? No, it just means from a human to human perspective, that sucks. That's their story. And they're gonna, they're the ones who have to live with it. And that's how it goes. Everyone's got a story. Make sure you can live with yourself. Because often what I think drives a lot of us into misery is our inability to live with ourselves. Face yourself, face your shadow, have a relationship with yourself. Because it's the best one you'll ever have. If it's healthy. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun.